Well, it is a good to be with you this morning as we sort of wrap up our journey of adulting. Have you felt like you've been growing up? I know I'm trying. Are you trying? It's what we need to be doing, right? We know what adulting is in our regular lives. We need to do this as well in our Christian lives as well, right? And we've been trying to figure that out. If you haven't already pulled out your worship notes, I hope that you'll do that. And certainly, again, want to welcome our online folks. And if you're new here in the room, thanks for being here. We're always grateful for your presence and sure hope you'll stop by the new here desk right outside the doors. You'll meet a great friend and get a, a great book that I hope you'll uh, enjoy. So um, what a great word Pastor O had for us last week, right, on diversity, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. What a powerful gift to remind us that in part that's what it means to grow up to the full stature of Jesus is a recognition that not only are we fearfully and wonderfully made, but everybody is fearfully and wonderfully made. And of course, that's been a part of our goal throughout this series is to recognize that um, we are challenged and called to grow up, to grow into the full stature of Jesus. And that's why we've been using Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13 as a foundational document for us, a verse uh, to claim about what it means to grow up. And so, as we've done these last several weeks, I'm going to invite you to just recite it with me aloud. It'll be on the screen or it's on your bulletin note cover there as well. Will you just join with me as we recite Ephesians 4, 13? God's goal is for us to become mature adults, to be fully grown measured by the standards of the fullness of Christ. So that's our goal. We remind ourselves uh, the bad news is we're not where we need to be. The bad news is we haven't quite arrived. The good news is, man, God's with us and for us, and God gives us second and third and fourth chances. And so the opportunity is for us to be blessed by God to actually get to this full stature of Christ. And, And we've talked about the ways in which money has impact on that, right? We talked a few weeks ago about how conflict has impact and how our faith has a role in the ways in which we address uh, conflict. And again, last week, Reverend O did a great job about diversity and how we live in diverse community and society and how our faith impacts that. Today, I want to talk about the last um, sort of hurdle of growing up into the full stature of Jesus. We're calling it vulnerability. And vulnerability on the surface doesn't sound like a big deal, but I believe vulnerability is a huge deal, Uh, not only in terms of our Christian faith, but it's become a very relevant topic uh, thanks to somebody named Brene Brown. You've heard that name, I'm sure. And she talks a lot about vulnerability and what that means for us as, as a society and as individuals. And that becomes a huge component of who we are, this vulnerability. In fact, I maintain, as your notes indicate, that I think that this is the highest value of Christian maturity, vulnerability the highest value of Christian maturity. Now, now ponder on that, friends, because we don't normally think of vulnerability as the highest value of Christian maturity. But I want to suggest that it is for a number of reasons, but first I want to say what I'm not talking about. When I talk about vulnerability, I am not advocating that if you are in an abusive situation or know people that are in an abusive situation, that that vulnerability needs to just remain you need to get out. That's not what we're talking about here. Likewise, I do not mean if if you know of of bullies or people who commit violence or if you're trapped in some of those kinds of circumstances where uh, you are vulnerable physically, I'm not advocating that you stay in that relationship. That's not what we're talking about here. What we are talking about, however, is a sense of vulnerability that is based in the Christian value of humility. Because, of course, humility is what Christ calls us to, and humility is the way in which Christ lived out His life. And so, ultimately, what what I mean by vulnerability is the willingness to let our Christ be our strength. Vulnerability is the willingness to let Christ be our strength rather than self-reliance. Because that's where most of us find ourselves, is we believe we're self-reliant, right? I'm good. I can handle this. I'm all right. I'll make sure this works out. I'm, I'm tough, right? I can figure this out. We all tend to rely on self-reliance because we're well-educated, we're well-prepared, we've been through life a little bit, we've been able to do some of this stuff on our own, and so we just kind of transmi- transmigrate that whole concept of, well, then I'll do this in faith and I'll do this in life and I can take care of it, but it's not good to do that. It's not helpful to our own lives and it's certainly not advantageous to our relationship with Jesus if we don't rely on Him for our strength. So vulnerability is relying on Him rather than ourselves, and that's what I want to spend some time on today because I think 
That's the highest value and sign of Christian maturity, that my life is based in Jesus' teaching, that my ways and my values are based in Jesus' ways and teachings, right? That's what we mean when we say Jesus is our Lord. When we say Jesus is our Lord, it means everything I want to do is according to His way. Everything that I want to live out and say and do is according to His way. He's my Lord. He's my boss. He's my master, right? So that's what we want to talk about today. So why is this important? If indeed it's one of the high values, there's got to be a reason why it's important. Well, I believe there's at least three, and hopefully you'll have a chance to write these down because I think these are absolutely critical to the reason we believe this is such a high value. The first reason I believe that uh, vulnerability is so terribly important is because it's a part of the original creation. Did you know that by your original design from the origins of all of creation, when God laid out all of creation, it was God's intent from the very beginning that we would be vulnerable? Now, you're thinking to yourself, I don't, what do you mean? I don't know. What, how can that work? And uh, God wanted us in this relationship. Yes, God wanted us in a relationship, but God wanted us in a relationship in which all of our strength and all of our being was reliant upon God. Here's how it worked. Some of us read right over this, we don't pay any attention, but this is absolutely fascinating. Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, it says, the man and the wife were naked and they were not ashamed. Well, you read that and you go, okay, well, they had no clothes on, so they were naked, right? Well, of course, that's what that means. But it also means something much more rich than that. Because see, the Bible wasn't written in English. The Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures were written in, in Hebrew. And the Hebrew word that we render as naked, it literally means they were vulnerable. That's what it means. Because that's what clothing helps us to do, is abdicate our vulnerability, right? I mean, the whole reason we wear clothes, at least the original reason, right? I mean, not all of us can be as fashionable as Doug, but I mean, that's how, you know, the way we, the reason we wear our clothes is because we wanted protection from the vulnerabilities of the elements, from predators, animals, so forth and so on, right? So when it says they were vulnerable and they were not afraid or ashamed, it speaks volumes about the way God intended for it to be. God intended for us to be invulnerable. Uh, God intended for us to be vulnerable. And in that vulnerability, God wanted to be in relationship with us. It was only after Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of the difference between good and evil that they thought to themselves, oh, oh, we're naked. We've got to do something about that, right? We've got to cover ourselves. But until that point, the original design was for us to be vulnerable. And I'm convinced we live this out. When we're born, we're naked, right? Did anybody have a kid born with clothes on? I mean, we come out naked and everybody goes, oh, isn't that sweet and lovely and wonderful and I love that baby and it's so cute and I love that. And then all of a sudden life takes over, right? And I'm convinced we are vulnerable in our lives through childhood until roughly age seven, eight, nine, at which point at we as a child begin to discover that our parents are not perfect. They don't have all the answers. They don't know everything. And, and that begins to crumble away at our vulnerability because we begin to ask internally, well, does that mean this or does that mean that if they don't know? And we begin down this trail of invulnerability. And then, of course, it magnifies itself when we get to adolescence because who of us doesn't know an adolescent, including ourselves when we were an adolescent, who had, didn't have every answer in the book, Right? And mom and dad had no answer that was correct, right? And so in adolescence, it mushrooms into, I've got all the answers. I can figure this out. I am invincible. Nothing bad will ever happen to me. I can do everything on my own. Leave me alone. I have a 15-year-old. Don't you know that? I mean, that's how that works, right? And then um, maybe, it depends on the person, sometime around age 25 to 30, somewhere in that time frame, we begin to realize, oh, Wow. I really don't have all the answers, and I don't know how to figure everything out, and I don't know how to do this next thing, and I don't know what's on my future. And, and then we get back to the vulnerability stage, and we're willing to sort of acknowledge, I, I need help in this. And we might actually ask our parents, or we might actually, actually ask somebody who's got a little more wisdom than us. And we travel down that road for a while until eventually somebody hurts us. They say something or do something, and they make it an unsafe environment for us to ask a question. And so we pull back again, and we step into invulnerability. I don't want you to know me. I don't want you to know that I'm insufficient. I don't want you to know anything about me. But here's the deal. From our original design, we were intended to be naked. That is to say, vulnerable. 
and not be ashamed of it. Not be ashamed that that's the way God created us. Not to be ashamed of the way that God wants that deep-seated relationship where we rely on God and in the Christian tradition, Jesus, for our strength. That's the first reason I believe this is important. God designed us that way. Second reason I think it's important is because, man, Jesus taught it all the time. All the time Jesus is teaching about vulnerability. Now, he didn't use that language. He never used that word. But the things that he did and the things that he taught were all about vulnerability. I mean, consider uh, when he went to the home of Mary and Martha because their brother Lazarus had died, what does Jesus do? He weeps openly. He weeps in front of them because he wants them to know it's all right to grieve, that that is a perfectly human and normal thing. He's vulnerable. He sets another example when um, he sees the money changers in the temple and he gets righteously anger about all that and then he lets the rage fly. He overturns the tables. That's completely vulnerable because he's just letting you know, here's where I am. Here's what I'm thinking. Here's what I'm feeling. This is not right. Vulnerability. When he finds himself in the Garden of Gethsemane before he goes to the cross, he asks a couple of his buddies, will you please pray with me? I need some prayer. I'm I'm desperately sad and anguished and and filled with tension and anxiety, and I don't know. And so he asks them to pray. He goes and prays. They fall asleep. He prays bitterly, literally. He weeps tears of blood because he wants this cup to be pulled from him, right? Vulnerability. Vulnerability. When he hangs on the cross, he hangs there and says quite loudly, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Fully transparent, fully genuine, fully vulnerable in front of God and everybody. By example, you see, Jesus is teaching us it's good to be vulnerable. It's a positive thing because you're relying not on self but on God. His teachings would do the same thing. He would teach on this over and over. But one of the great stories is not not a story so much as the the Beatitudes. In Matthew's gospel, Luke has them as well. But Matthew's gospel, chapter 5, he lists some of the Beatitudes. And one of them, Matthew 5, verse 5, is, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The meek, in essence, are those who are vulnerable, those who own their humanity and their humility and acknowledge that they need God. They will inherit the earth. In the Gospel of Luke, he would go on to say that um, for all who exalt themselves, (laughs) you're going to be humbled. And if you humble yourself, you will be exalted, lifting up the value of humility, which leads to vulnerability, you see. And and that's the gift. So Jesus teaches us how vulnerability is a positive thing. God created us that way. Jesus teaches us. And then finally, the other reason I believe this is valuable and why it's important is because Paul proclaims it. The apostle, in several of his letters, he will spend time communicating with the individual communities or, or generalities of the letters that he sends. And he would say to them, I am weak, but he, meaning Jesus, is strong. And he would speak that truth over and over again. One of the best ways we know about that is um, in only one occurrence, Paul references this thorn in his side. You may recall that. And scholars vary on what that might be. It might literally be a thorn in his side or some kind of physical ailment. Other scholars think it might have been an individual, many of whom we've had in our own lives, that was a pain in his side, right? Some person. Or it might have been a set of circumstances or a church maybe, a group of people that were just a thorn in his side. We don't know what it is, but we know that he had it. And he references it. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in referencing this thorn in his side, he says this about Jesus and what it means to him in his weakness. But he said this, meaning Jesus, he said this, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So Paul himself goes on, so I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Friends, that's the gift that Paul's trying to teach us is our weakness, our vulnerability is a very positive thing when we rely on Jesus. Because Jesus is the one who gives us the strength that we need in order to achieve whatever it is we think we need to achieve. That's where the vulnerability becomes a gift. 
It owns that I am not the strength of my life. God is. It owns that, that I need something bigger and better than myself. Christ. It owns that I am not total and I am not complete without the richness of this relationship with Jesus. Paul would believe this so much. He, uh, you back up one simple chapter in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and he says, look, if I'm going to brag about stuff, I, I'm going to brag about those humiliations that made me like Jesus. Wow, that's a pretty powerful statement. I'm going to brag about the humiliations that made me like Jesus. Well, you see, what the gift that Paul is claiming for us and that we need to identify is the gift of vulnerability, that I somehow need to own. I need God. I am not as whole as I could be, and my relationship with Jesus is important. So, I mean, God creates us this way. Jesus teaches it. Paul claim, proclaims it. Man, those are like the big dogs of faith, wouldn't you say? I mean, the only thing that could make this any better is if the Holy Spirit were brought into this scenario. Oh, wait. Jesus said, I will send you the Holy Spirit who will be your advocate, your counselor, your guide. And I don't know about you, but if I need a counselor and an advocate and a guide, it means I'm vulnerable. And that's the truth. That's who we are. And so part of what we need to just own and recognize is we are vulnerable, and it's not so bad because we've got Jesus. And we have the opportunity to rely on His strength to help make this possible. Here, here's what I believe about this. Uh, there in your notes. For Christians, true vulnerability is accepting that we are at our best when we are weak. I just want you to digest that a little bit. For Christians, true vulnerability is accepting that we are at our best when we are weak. Now, that's not logical, is it? It's not logical at all. I'm best when I'm fully prepared and I'm trained up and I'm good to go and I'm sufficient, right? That's when I'm at my best. That would be logical. But when has faith ever been logical? Faith is the belief where I can't see. Faith is the proof of what I'm hoping for, right? And so vulnerability says, I trust that Christ is the way. I trust that Christ is my strength, right? I trust that I can rely on this giver of every good and perfect gift. In fact, here's what I also believe. In our weakness, we rely on Christ who helps us to do all things. That's scriptural, friends. In my weakness, I rely on Christ to do all things. That's what Paul claimed, and I believe, and I pray you believe. When he wrote to the church at Philippi in the fourth chapter, he literally said that. I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. Notice it wasn't I can do everything on my own. I can do everything by my own accord. I can do everything I want to do. doesn't say any of that, does it? It says, I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. But the only way that can happen is if I abdicate my will, my desires, my ways, my seeming strength by becoming vulnerable to Jesus, to others, and then trust that Christ is my strength. That's an issue of faith. When we choose self-reliance, when we choose to do it on our own, when we choose to believe I am a self-reliant person, we live in sin. We've, we've rarely defined it that way, but that's what that is. If I'm not trusting in God, if I'm not trusting and believing God will provide for my way, I'm living in self-reliance, and that's sin. But here's what I also believe about vulnerability. Vulnerability is ultimately found in humility. That is to say, I own this. I recognize I'm not fully whole and I can't do all these things on my own. And so I humble myself before God. I submit my will and my ways to God. Now, humility is not, you know, beating myself up or, or claiming that I'm no good or thinking no good about myself. Humility, rather, on the other hand, is simply acknowledging I don't need to think about myself all that much. I mean, I'm not all that, right? 
It doesn't, it doesn't beat me up or anything. It just acknowledges I'm not as good as I think I am. <laughs> I, I recognize I need what it is God has for me. In part, what that looks like is um, for Christians, for Christians, followers of Jesus, I believe um, this is the capacity to believe more in Christ than in myself. That's what that means. I, I, I want to put more faith and believe more in Christ's capacity than my own. And man, that's hard because we know that we've accomplished stuff and we know that we can get things done and we know that we can achieve stuff. And so we tend to just get in overdrive, right, where we're just going to do it ourselves. But the goal of a mature follower of Jesus is to humble ourselves to Him, acknowledging our weakness and living into His strength. That's vulnerability. I learned this lesson years and years ago. Kay and I were very fortunate, my wife. Uh, we celebrated 30 years of marriage here a couple of months ago, and, and I, I reflected back on just prior to our, our wedding because uh, at the time I was going through ordination uh, and I was also in seminary, and Kay and I were dating, and we knew that we were getting married. And so the powers that be said to Kay and I, um, you guys need counseling. You need to go to premarital counseling so that you can, not because anything's wrong, but because you need to discover how to communicate well and how to be well situated and well prepared for your marriage and for all that and, and for uh, ministry. And, and so, you know, initially we're like, no, we're good. We got this. We got this figured out, right? I mean, we got a pastor and we've talked to her and yada, yada. And so we're good. We don't need that. That was pride. That was us saying, we're good. But the reality is, we're vulnerable. The reality is we're young. We don't know much. We have no clue what the future holds. We have no clue how we're going to work this out. So we realized at one point, man, we got to do this. We've got to go to the counselor. So we did. And uh, what the counselor pointed out to us is what you might imagine. You two are vulnerable. <laughs> he didn't use those words necessarily. He, 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 he didn't use the word weird, but he came real close to saying, you two are weird. What he did say quite literally is you both are introverts and you don't communicate very much because you're introverted and there'll be a lot of quiet time in your homes. And sure enough, there's a lot of quiet time in our homes because we're both introverts. But there was something that he said to us in either the second or the third session that has stuck with us now for more than 30 years and it's valuable to this point today. He said to us, you always need to do two things when you communicate. Always ask for what you want and say how you feel. Always ask for what you want and say how you feel. Now, he had a qualifier. The, the, want, is, the want is not, I, need, I want a new car or I want a new you know, widescreen TV or I want a new washing machine. No, that's not the wants I'm talking about. The wants, he said, are these. I want you to see me. I want you to hear me. I want you to embrace me. I want you to know me. I want you to care for me. I want you to provide for me. All of those relational wants, that's what he was saying. And you always have to say what you want. And guess how that goes over if you say, I want you to hear me, I want you to see me, and they go, yeah, not so much. That's called vulnerability. And when I say, I'm really angry at you because you did such and such, or I'm really desperate and, and, and dis in disparity because you, you caused this to happen, and they go, I don't care. That's vulnerability, right? And so a part of the lesson that we learned was to communicate what we want, knowing you may not always get it, but being willing to be vulnerable enough to share. Because there's no guarantee, he would say, that you'll get it. But there is a guarantee that if you never ask, you'll never get. To be truly vulnerable acknowledges that I don't have the answers, but what I need is you. What I need is what you're offering, and I need us to try to figure that out. Now, we've not always lived into this. We've not always done it well, but when we manage to figure it out and do what it is that was recommended, which was to be vulnerable, I'm here to tell you it made all the difference in the world because here's what we came to recognize and believe, and it's there in your notes, that there's nothing more vulnerable than sharing your genuine wants and your true feelings. Those two things can make you as vulnerable as possible. And that's positive. Because as followers of Jesus, we rely on His strength, not our own. 
We rely on His grace, not our own. We rely on His power, not our own, you see. That's the vulnerability. And it's a high level of Christian maturity because it's hard to achieve. It's one of the reasons I love our life groups here at the church. You know, our life groups are these small get-togethers of people who gather weekly, and they talk about faith, and they talk about their lives, and they, they express, good or bad, high or low, um, well or not, what their relationship with God is like. And it's a safe environment to say, man, I didn't, I didn't encounter God at all this week, or I don't have a clue where God was. It's a safe environment to say, I'm really struggling with and fill in the blank. And, and I can tell you from my own experience and from everybody I've ever heard from, that safe environment allows vulnerability to transform lives for Jesus. Because in that loving environment, I can encounter God's grace and mercy and forgiveness. And it's a beautiful thing. It's why we're launching yet again. We launch three times a year. And if you haven't gone, I want to encourage you to go even after this service to go get connected. I'd love for you to hear a story from Brittany this morning as well, because Brittany was new to our church about a year ago, and she found a life group, and it was life-transforming for her. Listen to her story. She shares both the vulnerability and the blessing. I fully believe that all of us worship God in different ways, and our journeys through Christ are very different. And the way that I come to God and and worship Him might not be the same as another person, but if I can be there to help somebody in their journey, I will do whatever I can in order to help them. So I've been in Dallas for the past few years and I hadn't found a church family. Well, as soon as I found Treach, I knew that's where my heart was and I had found a really good church, but I wanted to get really involved as much as I could. So, uh, they recommended actually joining a life group, and I just really clicked with this group right off, and, and it really worked out well. With all of us, the actual talking about what's going on in our lives, you know, we're either supportive or we tell each other, you know, there, there's an opportunity. We, we really just talk about everything. And we, we give a lot of laughs, too. and, and you know, we're indignant where we need to be and, and supportive, and it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful group. Life group is wonderful. Life group is family. Life group is really just coming together. Among many things, I believe, that makes Christianity and the gathered body of those who follow Jesus so impactful on people's lives is that it allows us a safe place to ask the questions, to reveal our frailties and faults, to share our doubts and wonders, to recognize that sometimes we're in a very dark place, but it's always safe because we have Jesus on our side. And when we live that out every single day or in a life group or in another accountability group or with someone else that we love, it can make all the difference in the world if we'll simply give ourselves over to that vulnerability and rely on Jesus. Here's what I believe most fully about that. Living vulnerably in humility is the, is the best way to attain God's will. Because, you know, God's will for our lives is that we trust God and that we follow God's teachings and that we live in God's ways. And I'm convinced that because God created us vulnerable and wanted us in that relationship, that's the only way then to fulfill God's will. So what do you say we try it? What do you say we become more vulnerable with each other, more vulnerable to God, more willing to say, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'd like to think about it. I hope that can be true. It's why I'm very excited about the next four weeks, because over the next four weeks, we're going to have a worship series called Naked Faith, where we're going to get down into the trenches yet again about what it means to be vulnerable, what it means to open ourselves up to who God is and how God is, and it's going to make a tremendous difference in our relationship with Jesus. 
because we're going to learn to rely on Him more than anything else. And isn't that why we're here? Isn't that who we are? We exist as a community of faith and a gathered body of followers of Jesus so that we can grow in a relationship with Him. And the only way we can grow in any genuine relationship, not the least of which is one with Jesus, is if we're real, vulnerable, authentic, genuine. It's the only way it works. So I'm excited that we are taking up the challenge to grow into the full stature of Christ. And for every last one of us, it'll be slightly different, but for every last one of us, it will call us to use the resources God's given us wisely, to enter into conflict graciously, to accept and work with and acknowledge everyone is created fearfully and wonderfully in the image of God, and that we need to submit our whole selves to Jesus so that we can be real with other people. What a powerful gift that is. Thanks be to God that God is right there with us leading the way. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, thank you. Thank you that you've been so very vulnerable with us by sending your son to cover our sins. Thank you, God, for wanting a relationship with us from the very beginning of creation that was nothing but real and genuine and vulnerable. So help us, God, now to have the courage to live well into that. Saying with every ounce of our being, I trust you, God, more than anything else. And I place my whole trust in Jesus. God, give us courage to do that very thing this day and the next as we seek to be real and vulnerable with you and with others. In the name of Christ, the great giver of life, we pray. Amen.